the last time we met on Tuesday, um, I had uh, noted the need to respond to some concerns uh, that had been registered uh, during the review of your ID three contributions. Um, and uh, I indeed addressed several of those types of concerns last time, particularly with my comments on on uh, peer reviews um, and, and some in uh, a few other areas as well. Um, but uh, today I'm going to address uh, a different a different um, type of concern, uh, one that's more technical uh, and based on uh, matters of, of uh, three-tier architecture or N-tier architecture more generally. Uh, discussion with your group last time had, uh, with the groups last time, uh, had indicated that uh, many of you are taking right now, I think it's 353, the, the web, um, the web course and uh, in that you were just encountering really for the first time issues of databases and multi-tier architectures other than glimpses in 370. Um, and I wanted to offer some comments on uh, some best practices there that I really like to see in the projects for this course, or at the least that are really important considerations for you as you go into industry, as you go and, um, and, and, and build these sort of architectures in commercial contexts. Uh, so when I looked over your contributions, I saw some anti-patterns involving, uh, involving web design that would absolutely not scale and would be, um, real problems in terms of extending the software design further. Um, these involve things like direct access to the, the database from the same code that was reasoning about business logic or access or generation of HTML based directly on the results of database calls. These are anti-patterns, which now for over a generation of, of uh, software development practice have been not only frowned upon, but recognized as really uh, problematic for building scalable, extensible, uh, systems that exhibit the sort of separation of concerns that allows teams to work on them. There are also anti-patterns from the standpoint of testability, being able to, to test different aspects of the system and being able to have different front ends uh, for it. And in many cases, these are uh, practices that are, are problematic as well for soundness of the, the types of operations involved with, um, with these systems in the context of concurrent access by many users. In other words, um, the sort of patterns that I saw there generating HTML based on direct calls to databases, calls directly to the database rather than working through model objects are not only inimical to performance and building these systems, extending these systems, scaling these systems, they can also lead to incorrect operations of these systems because of a lack of atomicity, a lack of transactionality. And it seemed from the discussion last time that these concepts were new to many of you. So I wanna go briefly as time allows into some understanding about modern architectures in place actually for 
a generation or so um, for handling web-based design and talk about some of the needs for them, talk about why certain things are anti-patterns and point to a set of resources that you can use with today's architectures that make it very easy to build much more scalable systems using popular platforms like Node and Express.js, um, uh, various types of databases, et cetera. So this is my goal for, for the next 40 or so minutes. Okay, um, so I'm gonna switch to my, um, uh, to my screens here and we'll, we'll get going. Um, I had to put this presentation together uh, closely, but I'll try to refer you to some resources um, for those who'd, who'd be interested. So um, I've designed this presentation to try to give specific note to contemporary technologies um, and, and singled out Node just because uh, several, first of all, because it's, it, it, it's a very popular means of supporting these sort of end tier architectures, but also because several of the teams in our class are working on projects um, that leverage Node. Um, and uh, the back end um, for Node and the front end for Node uh, jointly are built in a way that allows a multi layer architecture in which. Separate support is provided for database access, for business logic, manipulation of these data uh, access objects, a router layer to sort of route requests to various API endpoints, and in a presentation layer um, that can handle a sort of um, display of the information retrieved. And with this in mind, I'm, I'm going to be covering the motivations, the need for this, why it's so critical um, in the context of, of the web and um, how it can be used effectively to perform, to provide scalable systems. So when I think about traffic generated over the web, um, it, it observes many characteristics. It, it exhibits burstiness, it's 24 by seven, you have some periods of extremely say long tails, very, very high in terms of the distribution of number of accesses per, pick your time unit, per minute. Um, sometimes it's very, very intense when you really want, you know, your, your, your company to shine because many, many users are interested. And then there's times where it's, it's very low, um, but it has a very long tail on the upper side. You can get tons of hits uh, in short periods of time if you're successful. Um, if people are interested. Um, there's data that has to persist between these things. You, you get hit, you, you, you show a user or something, but there needs to be data maintained um, uh, about their session state, et cetera. Um, critically, there's concurrent access by many users. And this may seem a random factoid, but the basic picture is that um, you can have many different users on your system undertaking many different actions. So for those working with the long COVID um, participant portal, for example, you may have an admin user going and uploading new data at the same time that several, several um, patient users um, not admins are inspecting their data. And there's a need to handle that concurrently or equally much so for those working with the, um, with the app for, for stakeholder Filipenko. Um, there might be new videos assigned to a user at the same time the user is, is interacting with the system. And a system has to be able to handle that robustly, reliably, without skipping a beat. Um, you know, this traffic is also notoriously um, insecure. You may get, um, you will get regularly hacking attacks. 
and there could be significant lag, uh, latency associated with response um, uh, to it. And, and it's a connectionless protocol. It's a protocol which there's no, you know, con consistent, there's no persistent connection. When I, I go hit uh, a browser with a browser, a, a website, and it um, connects, normally there's not a persistent connection maintained. And um, the connection may, you know, I may not do anything more on the site, and after a while the session will time out, but there's actually no bits being sent back and forth between me and the site for for most contexts we deal with. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, a risk that certain actions may take place multiple times without realizing it. Now, in this context, there's a set of needs that come up with respect to software architecture. One is a need to separate out for the sake of testing, for the sake of dividing up the development work, for the sake, it turns out, of scalability, um, uh, for the sake of, of, of extensibility, separation of concerns of different layers of the system. And most fundamentally, and from earliest on, it was between user interfaces, the sphere of web design, et cetera, um, and for, for the design of the web apps with business from business logic, the kind of logic of the application that governs its rules, who's allowed to do what, under what conditions, what do actions mean, that, that captures sort of the basic semantics, the basic logic of the situation. And then data storage. And the idea was, you know, you should be able to have multiple front ends, maybe a web-based interface, maybe smartphone-based systems um, uh, that might access the same business logic, work through the same business logic and the same data storage. Um, this layer, the web design layer, updates much more frequently than these later two layers. And you want to decouple that. You might want to test this layer, for example, without going through the web UI, et cetera. It needed to be adaptable, um, uh, quickly uh, updated to handle uh, new volumes of traffic, for example, fault tolerant. So if it fails, it fails gracefully in a way that doesn't incorrectly charge a user for a product that's not shipped, for example. And these days, there's a lot of interest need importance attached to data rich interaction. You know, we're dealing with large volumes of data and we want to be able to support that within our systems. You also need high availability. Um, so it's available 24 by seven you know, with minimal downtime. And, and critically, uh, and it seems that this was not a concept that many here were really familiar with, you want it to be transactional. You want it to be atomic, consistent, and to have independent updates and be durable, so-called acid properties that are the hallmark of safe database operation, safe and provably correct database operation um, when you have many actions at once. So when I say transactionality, I, I know it's a new concept to many of you, or it sounds like it is. And I, I want to give, you know, a sort of concrete example here. So, so suppose someone's, you know, buying a book on Amazon or buying a, a, some, some uh, new, new product there, or, or, or fancy a keyboard or whatever. Um, when you're working with that system, um, you want it to always handle a series of, of underlying actions in a consistent way, in a way that's a transaction. So things happen together or not at all. You either, it either takes your money and, and ships you the product or less desirably, but still acceptably, something happens and it does neither, right? It, it doesn't, take your money and it doesn't ship you the product. The real problem comes in 
when you, if it takes your money and it doesn't ship you the product, that's really bad, right? That's not acceptable. Um, it's also not acceptable for Amazon to ship you the product and not take your money. That would be a, bus a losing business proposition. So things have to happen together. Taking your money and shipping the product are two sides of it. They either both occur or neither occurs, but they occur and or fail together. You don't have one occurring and the other not just because you know, it's taking your money and then there's an error and it can't ship the product, that would not be acceptable. Either both need to go forward or neither goes forward. That's what we look for in tr a transactional context. And this is not easy to achieve. There's a lot of theory behind this, computer science theory about how to make systems transactional, how to make them atomic. So you it looks like neither has occurred, and then suddenly both have occurred. And, and you don't see any intermediate state where only one has occurred and the other hasn't. So asset properties are a key thing we look for when we're seeking to manipulate data uh, in a concurrent context. You don't want one party to see halfway through the transaction being undertaken with another party. Um, and you want high performance, low latency, high throughput, able to handle many, many visitors per day. You want to be able to scale it, put in more money, and have your web server be able to handle more users, for example, scale up your database as the number of long COVID study participants scales up. You want it to be durable so it commits things and it it's that information is saved away, maybe about you know a user is no longer allowed or an admin has been added um, to the set of admins or whatever. Um, data has been uploaded um, correctly. And it, of course, it needs to be secure and be able to handle critically this concurrency. Um, the issue with concurrency is, you know, we're gonna have many users at once, many users interacting with the system. And some of the, actions of a given user, if, if implemented naively, like I saw in some of the code, can involve several steps, any of which might fail. And yet, if one of them fails, often you need the others to fail. You want that transactionality. Uh, and unless you protect against it, when you have multiple users using your system concurrently, if you, don't, if you don't build it in a way that's conscious to it, you can get interference between them. And going back to the Amazon example, you, know, you could have two users at Amazon at about the same time going to order the same product. Only one of it is left. And you know, both claim it before it's recorded as gone. You only want one to be able to claim it and, and the money to be taken from that one and not from the other. You don't want to take the money of both and only one can claim it and the other one's left you know, um, in bad situation. You want one to both have their money taken and get the product and the other to have the money not taken and they can't get the product. And the risk is if you don't design it for that, you may get both charged and only one gets it. So you want things to be transactional to deal with concurrency. It's because of concurrency, we care especially much about transactionality, these acid properties, atomic, consistent, independent, and durable. And I don't know the degree to which this is you know, handled in, in 353 because it's one semester course for an awful lot of material. Um, okay, um, now there are some downsides or trade-offs associated with this. There are, there's extra complexity that comes with it. The need for locking, for example, which can cause, if you're not careful, issues with database timeouts. Um, you know, risk of deadlock if, if it's not um, designed properly. 
Uh, there can be performance uh, hits, et cetera. Now, you may think, well, this sounds all nice and good for, for, um, uh, for you know, projects in general, but where does this really impact our needs? And I, I alluded to this earlier, but I want to mention it again. Like, look, if, if you're in the long COVID database portal and an admin user is loading data, at the same time users are browsing the data, you don't want, you don't want that user to see only half their data because the data is being loaded at the same time. You don't want them to see it in an inconsistent state, halfway there that the data is loaded. You want the data to be updated as a transaction. So the user can be interacting, can see their data as it was. So maybe the data is starting to be uploaded by the admin and a user is there whose data is represented in the data being loaded and they should either see the data as it was before the update happened until the data is totally loaded, entirely present in the new system. And then they see it as it is at that time. The complete data is there. They shouldn't see it halfway through where half their data is loaded and half it isn't. That is a, is a way towards Madness. I mean, really, at a software development level, it leads to all sorts of problems because you're dealing with inconsistent situations and it leads to assertions to fail, et cetera. But it also leads the users to be, you know, um, utterly puzzled. Um, you know, again, if, if, if you have an admin user assigning a video for a patient and the work with Dr. Filipenko, you, you don't want... You don't want them to sort of see half the information about the video and not, not the other half or something like that. You want it to be entirely assigned to them or, or not at all. So these issues come up when you get concurrency, you get several users whose tasks can interact. Maybe it's, I wanna buy the same product as you do, though you interact in that sense, only one of us can get it. Or, or you know, I'm uploading data which affects what you see, and you you want it to be transactional. Okay, so um, this is a big need. You know, the web is 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 a um, complicated place to 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 build for. Um, uh, it has special types of technologies we use to work for it, and because of that, we have all these kind of common needs in building up systems, particularly those to make sure it's sound, that it's correct, what's seen, and that it won't, we won't get these weird halfway states that cause havoc with our code correctness. We need transaction um, and it comes up in your project. So how do, how have generations of software developers risen to this challenge? Well, they've risen through this, this uh, long-standing commitment to building systems that rise to this challenge. And one of the, the most important components of that is this idea of a three-tier or in general N-tier architecture, where N is a, it's a variable indicating it's greater than three. Um, Multi-tier architecture. Now, the term is a bit, is, is off, misunderstood because um, sometimes people think of it as or mistakenly think of it as kind of a matter of where the hardware lives um, but not necessarily so it, it the issue is that there are logical layers of the system like this you see for node.js okay there's logical layers that exhibit a separation of concerns we'll come back to that point and that separation of concerns and this decomposition here allows us to address the scalability, concurrency, transactionality, and other challenges that I spoke about earlier. Now, it may not be obvious. Why, why does layering help? Well, it turns out it does, but we'll get there. Let, let's talk about these layers. The major layers are 
a presentation or front end. That's that's this. Now, critically, you may again have multiple of these, right? There may be one for iPhone, one for Android, one for web-based clients. And by by having this as a separate layer from these lower layers, you can you can allow that decomposition, right? It's not all one big hairball. It's one auto one monolithic thing. You can have different presentation instantiations for different supporting things. They all use these lower lower tiers. So you get this kind of ability to, to mix and match. Now in Node.js, there's this router layer, which kind of routes HTTP requests to these different API endpoints. Um, that's not that significant, but it's uh, in, in a conceptual level, but it's an important part of Node.js. So I include it here. What's most important um, compared to that is, is this layer that has to do with business logic, uh, service layer, it's commonly called these days. In earlier times, we'd often call it the model layer or domain layer. And, and here you're dealing with kind of the, the logic of the situation of the application. Um, uh, so you've got kind of the rules of the road, the game, the rules of the game um, here for what things mean, what needs to happen with what, um, how you handle different requests. Um, uh, and that's separated out from the presentation of it. And it's separated out critically from the data side. It's not coupled directly to the database. No, 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 no. It's not making direct calls to the database. It operates through models. And these models um, in Node.js are handled with data access objects, um, uh, but they kind of abstract away um, how the database is being hit. And importantly, this business logic can maintain these larger amounts of data that it can manipulate without going to the database every time. So it will read in chunks of information into objects, for example, these data op, uh, access objects, and, and then use them rather than going directly to the database with multiple hits, which is like the kiss of death for performance hitting the database every time you need information. No, 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 you read things in and, and you have a bunch of information that you squirrel away in these, in these models. And these models you, you can interact with without needing to hit the database again and again and again. Um, and then there's this data access layer, which you know handles databases and data storage. Okay. Um, uh, this has evolved over the years. This is an earlier uh, rendition from, gosh, almost 20 years ago, where you know you have multiple clients. Um, I updated this actually for mobile application at an earlier technology. And you have sort of a server farm to handle the middle layer. Um, this, this business logic, business uh, logic layer, and, and resources handled for the data access layer. But this this general pattern of multi-tier architectures that allow this decomposition um, is, is absolutely central to, the, um, to, to this need to deliver effectively. Now, why is that? Well, look, um, having these different layers allow a clear separation of concerns here uh, into, you know, you can have different things dealt with at the data layer, dealing with the databases, what lives in what database and you know uh, where that's located on which server or what have you, um, separate from the, from the business logic, which itself is separate from the presentation layer. So as we said, we can have different people work on each of them, different technologies on each of them. You can have, uh, you know, uh, different uh, mixing and matching, as, as we said, you know, different UIs, for example, and you can have independent updates of these layers. So, you know, often the presentation layer, it's more fickle, right? It updates more frequently. Um, and 
uh, this um, this uh, this decoupling allows that evolution to occur much more frequently than um, you need to touch the business logic, which is kind of more basic to your application. It's more conserved. It, it, it sticks around for a lot longer without changes. Um, and then similarly, there's a data access layer, which might change as you, you know, evolve your, your backend data storage. Um, you can scale independently for each layer. Um, you get a multiple web servers to handle the presentation layer, multiple middleware machines to handle this. Uh, and you can have multiple databases if you want, multiple database instances for like a uh, um, distributed database um, to capture to capture more performant um, instantiations of this. And that's really effective. You can also mock out some of these layers. So for example, when you're testing the business logic, you don't have to test it with the database, right? You could, you could mock out this layer. And you don't have to test it with the presentation. You could have code directly, um, directly programmatically test the service layer, okay? Um, and that direct testing um, doesn't have to work through a UI. Uh, and so it, it can be much more performant and um, it's much easier to write. Um, it doesn't break when you change the presentation. Um, it's not like uh, Selenium or, or other types of tests, which, which are coupled at some level to the presentation. Instead, you can write it to head against this database layer, um, excuse me, against the, the service layer directly. So you can, more easily test in, in using mocking, mock out these different components. Testability is really enhanced uh, by these sort of um, division, uh, the separation of concerns. Um, now, this architecture comes with a set of um, kind of no-nos and, and problems that have been proven disastrous for it or bad for it, and it varies. Um, but, you know, sort of a, a recognition of what it takes to build a system that scales of this sort, a system that's solid. Um, and there's a lot of kind of aesthetics that come out of this. Like one of the, the real anti-patterns is mixing together the user interface and the business logic um, in a single place um, in the same layer. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, uh, mixing together the user interface and business logic in a single, in a single um, area of the code base. Um, this, this can require um, too many connections if you have a UI layer that calls directly to the database, for example. You could have, if you have hundreds of clients or thousands of clients, people accessing your site, it can try to open these connections directly to the database and end up not being able to succeed because it's run out of connections to database. Database connections are really expensive to create. To create a database uh, connection can take quite a bit of resources. And if you have you know, a thousand people accessing your site at once, you may run out of these connections, in which case, you know, they get an error uh, on the site. If you have this direct calling off of the UI here to the data, to the, um, uh, to the data, to the data side and to the database of the sort that I saw in some of the code. Um, if you have, it, it, it also brings up a need like to be very careful about how you design your business logic so it doesn't hit the database too much. One thing I saw which really concerned me in the code was fine-grained data access calls, like calling off to, to get information um, for, for each little thing that, that you're, you need about the user. Instead of just reading in a bunch of information, a batch of information and storing it. And 
Uh, this is a, a particular problem because going to the database and going on a round trip is expensive. So you want to instead get this data loaded into these, uh, these model objects and manipulate it there. And in the business, uh, the business logic layer, um, you're not hitting the database all the time. You, you've got enough information that you can carry around about the data that you don't have to go tons and tons of time to the, uh, to the database. Um, you wanna be careful about not keeping um, uh, too many connections. Um, and there's some other aesthetics we don't have time to, to, to fully cover. I, I've, I've covered some of the basic ones here. Um, now, there's different architectures for allowing this to handle, and one to be handled effectively. Um, some of them are stateless. Um, so they have these stateless objects, which are pooled and, and undertake tasks uh, for the user against, um, against the database. Uh, you, you wanna have objects that handle big batched queries to the data and, and get back a bunch of information so you don't have to go on a fine grained level to the database. And you have transactioning. You have this um, often declarative characterization that you want to begin a transaction and complete a transaction at the end of some some bit of logic that otherwise that would require multiple um, types of database operations, multiple interactions with data. And you want to mark it as a transaction so it all gets done at once. It's atomic. It's as if it hasn't started yet or it's completed from the standpoint of other parties. They never see it halfway through. And support for transactioning is, is foundational for correctness in the context of concurrency. I hope I raised that, that understanding to you. So modern multi-tier architectures such as Node.js support transactions, the ability to create and complete or roll back transactions. By that, I mean, uh, you start the transaction, you say, hey, the next bunch of things would be to all occur together. And, 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 it's gonna be performing those in a way that if one of them fails, all of them will be rolled back. So they will be as if none of them took place. And you can at any time say, hey, something's gone wrong, roll back everything. And it's as if you never started the process, nothing's been updated. Um, um, or you say, hey, Everything occurred fine. The user was charged their money. The book was, was sent to them. They claimed the book. And now we complete the transaction. And all the actions which have been sort of tentatively queued up for occurrence have been provisionally undertaken are now committed and the entire thing commits. So that's a, a transactional um, uh, atomic operation. Um, and these systems generally support that. Some support object pooling and just-in-time activation, et cetera, scalable hardware with server farms, database replication. So you can have more scalable databases by handling some of the needs to this database, some to that. Um, and, and data storage um, um, in a database or sometimes in the client on an encrypted basis. Um, uh, I think I'm gonna gonna leave that. Um, I think I'll go light also on this side, but um, a common pattern that was uh, prominent in some technologies like uh, Microsoft's uh, uh, Microsoft's technology for ASP.NET, et cetera, is the use of stateless middleware uh, where, Basically, you have 
you avoid creating state pull objects and instead you have client state there and you have the support for a connectionless protocol by a combination of storing data in the database and on the client and you have pooling of objects so you have a small number of objects that are fairly small that that handle can handle interactions with the database and you never give out more things than you can support in database calls. Um, you have load balancing across different systems and uh, you have fault tolerance uh, better supported as well through sort of failover mechanisms. Uh, and, and transactional support uh, provided for the stateless middleware. Um, a, a real important component of this is what I mentioned earlier with with avoiding fine-grained calls to a database. So the idea is, look, when you need data from the database, rather than dividing it up into small calls like you might, if you're thinking in a classic object-oriented way, get this property, get that, get that separately, you, you read into a model that stores data locally. And, and you read that in at once. And then you interact with the model to ask, for example, about different properties of this user or to, to get different subsets of the user data to be shown in a timeline. You don't hit the database you know, many, many times to get different subsets of that data or different aspects of the user, you know, their username or, or their, their type of, of um, uh, role that they're playing or whatever. You, you try to build, try to get as much uh, as you can there so that you limit the amount of round tripping you have to do to the database. Um, so while object-oriented design, we often have small methods and many classes and you, you have complex calls that are made up out of calls to finer grain things, maybe setters and queries. You can't afford to do this because going to the database is just too expensive. So in Node.js, for example, on the business level, business logic layer, the, the, the uh, this sort of service level, uh, service layer, you have these, these model objects, um, the DAO, data access objects, which can be manipulated here and used and which capture the data read in from, from the database uh, and allow you to manipulate it without, again, going to the database on an ongoing basis. Um, there's, there's two issues here. One is long latency, like, like calling to get the data and get to get back. It's gonna take a really long time by computational standards, a very, very long time to get that data and the user will be waiting. Um, there's also limits on throughput, how many people you can handle per day if you do this because there's locking, database locks then, that can be taken out associated with this that prevent many people from making concurrent pro progress. So really what you wanna do is manipulate these sort of larger, larger uh, sets of data and model objects and, and avoid many round trips. So some recommendations for this. Um, so one is you, you, you really wanna leverage these layers that frameworks make possible. Know your frameworks, understand their, their, their recommended layering. It's different for different frameworks, the, the details of it. Um, but learn how to use it effectively. Learn what each layer kind of is supposed to do in terms of manipulating objects. So I showed node.js here. Um, it's not privileged, but this is, you know, what you would interact with with Node and Express, for example. And those are jointly, um, you know, key components of many of these web frameworks. Those here may well have heard in 353 or other contexts, 
about these various popular web stacks. Mean, MERN, for example, um, MEVN. Um, so, so here we have, in many cases, it's, it's Mongo, Express, Angular, and Node as technologies, or Mongo, Express, React, and Node, or, or instead of, instead of Angular or, or React, View and Node. Um, these are various super popular stacks, and each of them will have a somewhat different decomposition. For example, with Mongo in MongoDB, you have Mongoose that handles a lot of these models here used for interacting with the, with the data in the business logic layer without going to the database and hitting. No, respect and know your framework well. And if you have these layers available, you should be trying to make sure that your application accords with those. So that's, that's one point here. A second point is, um, and uh, okay, I'm not uh, sure where, okay. Um, where are my recommendations? Come on. Um, okay, um, yeah. Avoid front end or service layer calls that are going directly to the database. I mean, those are, those are to be avoided like the plague. Do not, do not, make a call directly from the presentation layer to the data access layer. That is the kiss of death for scalability. It will not scale. In fact, it will cause an error when you get a lot of clients hitting this because you'll exhaust the database connections and bad things will happen. Like the user will get a, an indication that the, uh, their access has failed, that, that it's unable to complete their request. You do not want that. You want a scalable web app. And the scalable web apps are made possible by these technologies and these decomposition layers. And by things like pooling of database connections and pooling of objects here, et cetera, which these frameworks provide. Um, do not have service layer calls also directly to database. Go through the model objects so that you manipulate the data retrieved from the database in batch through these model objects, rather than hammering the database directly with lots and lots of calls. It's not a matter of does it work. It, look, it, it can work, but it will only scale up so much and then it won't work. <laughs> it, will, it will only work to a certain point. And if you are hitting these things without a transactional wrapper, the danger is that it will give incorrect results because you know each person will see the middle of the other the other transactions and the user will be presented with data halfway loaded about themselves and the code will fail because certain invariants won't be true about the database perform as much as possible in these batch database queries and updates and um Use service level business logic to manipulate um, the database via models and know about the requisite transactioning and where required, put in place the transactions that group multiple data access needs into, um, into a, single, a single operation, a single conceptually atomic operation. Okay, so know your frameworks use them. There's tons of information online and uh, on, on different frameworks and how to use, how to use them in a multi-tier or N-tier or three-tier or layered context. Try to make sure you use that because the techniques that you've learned in earlier courses may be workable, but they're not scalable, and they will fail under high demand, and they will not handle, in some cases, concurrency with soundness and in a way that's reliable. And this will lead to Heisenbugs that you know only appear 
when you have lots and lots of demand for your system, which is when you want your system to shine, it'll be most likely to fail. And you don't want that. You want to build it not on sand, but on rock in terms of a secure foundation. Okay. So uh, we're out of time. Um, this is just a glimpse to these areas that uh, I hope you might get exposed to in some of your earlier classes, but because you know, you're still traversing 353 and because you might not even see some of these things given the course's brevity, I thought I needed to, to make an emphasis of the importance of understanding the requisite software architectures and resources and best practices um, in this uh, key contemporary context of multi-tier web applications. Okay, so that's all I have time for here. Um,